Hi, this is Lindsay Odin, Special Research Assistant at the Washington State Attorney General's Office, and this is your AGO Moment in History. In this series, our office will be releasing clips from our Oral History Project, an ongoing effort to collect and preserve the history of the Attorney General's Office as told by the people who have worked here over the years. In today's episode, former Deputy AGs Jeff Goltz and Shirley Batten interview former Attorney General Ken Eikenberry about his relationships with the Governor's Office and other state agencies. Eikenberry, a Republican and former chair of the state Republican Party, served three terms as Attorney General, and during two of his terms, the Governor's Office was occupied by a Democrat. Eikenberry discusses how the AGO and the Governor's Office cooperated, and how the working relationship between the two offices underscored the importance of maintaining an independent AGO. Let's take a listen. So also now, you know, when you came to office in 19, uh, 1980, uh, uh, one, the, uh, you were now the chief legal officer for the state of Washington. Now you're the chief lawyer for the governor and everyone else. So what was your, and the governor, although she appointed you for a short period of time for part of your fourth term, um, she was a Democrat. And so you had the, uh, the governor's office and all the agencies were Democrats and you were a Republican. What was your relationship like with Governor Ray or the relationship of the office with Governor Ray? <clears throat> well, that's, that's an interesting question because, of course, I'd been critical, personally critical of Governor Ray, but uh, that quickly turned around as she continued to see that we vigorously defended cases brought against her and just as an example I will mention the uh, Mount St. Helens explosion, because initially we were sued, the state of Washington and Governor Ray and other people associated with the office were sued by the merchants from the town of Cougar on the grounds that uh, the circle was uh, had been drawn around, the, the danger circle had been drawn around Mount St. Helens, was too big, and it kept uh, customers from going into the town of Cougar and uh, buying uh, material. And uh, then uh, when the mountain blew up and some people were injured or killed, uh, we, the state and the same, many of the same people were sued by uh, people who claimed that uh, the circle had not been big enough. And it was, but it was, it's, I mentioned this uh, not as an isolated incident because um, if someone were going down the highway and they hit a Jersey barrier and were thrown into their own lane and hit by following traffic, then they would sue the state on the grounds that the Jersey barrier was faultily installed. If there were no Jersey barrier, of course, they would cross over into oncoming traffic and there would be injuries and people killed and we'd be sued because, so it's, the state was a big fat ripe target. Uh, and, uh, my determination was to make it less of a target. And one of the things that we did was to, now well, this is a different topic, but one of the things we did was to uh, make sure that our client, our agency client, uh, quit doing things like renegotiating construction projects that just were guaranteed progenitors of uh, lawsuits because they would become an accustomed, to, they, they had become accustomed to just making changes in the way the construction was done, whether it be a highway, whether it be a building, uh, whatever it might be, and then sue the state afterwards for the injuries that they, quote, injuries they had sustained. And so during your tenure as Attorney General, there was a governor, and uh, there was a, a Democratic governor uh, during two Two terms, Correct. and how did you manage those relationships? How were those relationships? Those relationships, I thought, were just fine. We got along very well. <laughs> and again, it's a matter of personal um, relationships. Because with Governor Spellman, I'll give you a quick example. I was called by his office to uh, fill in for him at the opening of the Marriott Hotel up in the uh, SeaTac. And they, uh, so the newspaper the next day featured uh, some big pictures of me and the head of Marriott, the Marriott chain, wearing these silly looking uh, masks with bills that come across here, wooden masks. 
and but we're in a canoe and there's quite a leads quite a story about the fact that we've been there for for the and that was the last time the governor's office ever called me but i i can't help but think that uh it was the governor's wife who was jealous of the fact that i had made that appearance for him <laughs> but um and then of course in the case of democrat the democrat governor booth Gardner, we got along just fine and um, probably had a better working relationship than I did with the Republican. So let's, you touched on the independence of the office a little bit, but let's go back to that. So what did it mean to you to have an independent attorney general's office? How was that important to you? Well, it was very important um, to be an independent attorney general uh, that is independent from other statewide offices and uh, independent from being under the thumb of anyone who might be making uh, your decisions otherwise. To um, and I just think that that's part of being a lawyer, and uh, that's the way that the state office should be conducted. You know, this business of collaborating with the governor in particular, I think, is is the wrong way to go. And during your tenure as AG, did you see other AG offices around the country that you thought were partisan or more partisan? <clears throat> well, yes. Um, in Alaska, for example, the uh, governor or the attorney general is appointed by the governor, and one or two other states follow that example. And in, uh, I, shoot, let's see. I can think of the attorney whose name was Tierney at that time, but I can't Mass think of Massachusetts. Massachusetts. I think, yeah. think Massachusetts. Tierney, Massachusetts. Yeah. I think they're appointed by the legit by vote of the legislature there, and of course the prevailing majority is the ones who make the call. And uh, so those people are particularly prone to partisanship, but I think others make the mistake of thinking that they should be partisan. So anyway, I seem to me that independence, nonpartisanship, was the hallmark that we should follow. And during uh, Attorney General Gorton's tenure, there was an attempt by the legislature to try to dismantle the independence of the Attorney General's office by statute, and that failed. Uh, did you ever see any similar attempts to do that during your term? Um, not that I recall in Washington State, although there were there were bills that we regarded as being undesirable because they tended to erode uh, the independence of the office. Uh, I don't. It's hard. For, I cannot recall a yeah. particular instance. And do you think? In your opinion, is there anything about the structure of the uh, office that naturally lends itself to uh, conflict with other state agencies? Hmm. Well, I can see uh, conflicts arising uh, within, within, among a yeah between agencies. And that the attorney general's office was in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Many times. Many times. Yeah. And um, I'm trying to think of an example I could give you that would not irritate too many people, but <laughs> I cannot. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for listening to this AGO Moment in History. Be sure to like and subscribe to receive updates when we upload a new episode. On our next episode, General Eikenberry discusses changes in the AGO during his tenure. Thanks. Talk to you again soon.